Hello everyone, thanks for being here today. Uh, I'm Rodrigo Romarowski from the University of Pavia. Uh, I'm a member of the student committee of the European Society of Fire Mechanics. And today we would like to introduce you to our fifth webinar of, of this series, which is called uh, ITK SNAP, Open Source Software for Medical Image Segmentation. Uh, today's webinar is going to be led by uh, Paul uh, Yushkevich, and Alison Pausch from the Penn uh, Image Computing and Science Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. So they are uh, very the active developers of ITK SNAP. Um, ITK SNAP is actually a very powerful tool. I use it daily. So I really hope that you will find this presentation useful and interesting. So it's going to be structured like this. Uh, we're going to have a presentation of uh, 45 minutes. Uh, first, Paul is going to speak, then Alison is going to speak. And then we have uh, 15 minutes for question and answers. So we would like to ask you to, whenever you have a question, to write it down in the GoToWebinar chat. Uh, and then uh, at the end, we're going to, to read them aloud and, and share them with, with the speakers. Um, so uh, it's all set. So I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thanks a lot, Paul and Alison. And, and the floor is yours. So let me go to Paul first. Well, hello. Um, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for organizing this and for inviting us. Um, there goes my screen. I hope you can see my screen now. Um, so it, it's a pleasure to talk to you about uh, ITK SNAP. It's a tool that uh, our group has been working on for uh, many years. Um, I myself have worked on it for 20 years, which sounds incredible. Um, and uh, hopefully, um, some of you will find it uh, useful for your own work. Uh, so um, I'll just give an overview of the overall 45-minute um, uh, presentation today that's going to be divided between Allison and I. So I'll start by just introducing to you a little bit of the uh, background and history of ITK SNAP, um, uh, some uh, metrics of its use. Um, then I'll focus on the main functionality, which is uh, image segmentation. Um, spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, I'll highlight some of the newer features that we've added in recent years, like uh, image registration and uh, distributed processing, where you can uh, send complex segmentation tasks to a third-party server to do the hard work for you. And then Allison will do a demonstration of a hard valve analysis and ITK SNAP and um, some of her work in that area is relevant uh, to the biomechanics community. So I hope you'll enjoy that. So what is ITK SNAP? Um, you can see on the right just a typical um, screenshot of, its be of ITK SNAP being used uh, here for uh, aortic, aortic valve segmentation. And um, it's a interactive tool, so it's a uh, graphical user interface for labeling structures in 3D image volumes. Now, most people use it for medical image, uh, medical imaging, but you can also use it for non-medical applications as well. Um, many kinds of 3D data can be loaded and, and uh, visualized and annotated in this tool. I think SNAP is open source software. Uh, it's written in C++, and we provide binaries um, for, and installers for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux uh, platforms, which basically covers uh, most of the um, computers around today. And this tool was, um, you know, what, what sort of sets this tool apart from some of the other software, some of the other open source software in the imaging domain is that we try to keep it easy to learn and use for clinicians and, you know, non-computer scientists. So we try to keep a learning curve relatively, um, relatively flat. And we do this by limiting the amount of features uh, that we introduce into the tool. So um, I think SNAP is not a tool that has lots of different plugins and lots of different, um, you know, variants of tools that you might find in some of the other software like uh, 3D Slicer or ImageJ. It's really um, quite focused on tasks of 
image segmentation or interactive image segmentation. And before adding any feature, we always sort of consider is that feature, is it going to be supporting our main vision of segmentation? Um, and is adding this feature going to um, add significantly to the learning curve? And that's kind of the criterion for adding new features. So here's a little bit of, of the history uh, on this tool. So it was started uh, back in the 20th century in 1999. Um, it was called Snake Automatic Partitioning, which is where SNAP comes from. And it was developed as a team programming project um, by computer science students at the University of North Carolina under leadership of Guido Garrick, um, who was uh, one of my PhD uh, advisors. And um, so I, I was a graduate student at this time. And um, I started working on this tool around this time. And um, at, this is when the ITK, the NIH Shinsai Toolkit came out. Um, and this toolkit is a C++ toolkit that has a very powerful uh, set of tools for image analysis and image processing. And we worked on integrating this SNAP tool uh, with ITK, which is when it became ITK SNAP. And then on and off, um, uh, we've gotten funding to add more features to the tool, redesign the user interface, make it a little more modern, support multimodality data, and keep adding advanced features. And most recently, um, Allison has spearheaded uh, a grant application for the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative um, to um, develop features in ITK SNAP that will specifically support uh, dynamic image analysis, so analysis for dimensional imaging data with applications in biomechanics. Just to um, point out some of the statistics, so uh, we've been fortunate that there's been a lot of use of the tool. Uh, almost 5,000 papers uh, in Google Scholar have cited our, our main paper, and we're getting about 60,000 downloads per month. And uh, also point out that there's a 30 or more contributors who have uh, contributed code and a pretty large code base in ITK SNAP right now. So it's a pretty mature and uh, large tool, but still, as I said, focused on its core mission. <laughs> All right, so what is the functionality of this tool? So what, what are the main ways in which it can be used? So first and foremost, um, it's a 3D image viewer. So it's a way to load images uh, in different image formats uh, Nifty, DICOM, and uh, close to a dozen other formats can be read. Um, you can load more than one image volume and uh, you know, overlay volumes, uh, align volumes, and so on. Um, so looking at MR and CT or T1 MRI and T2 MRI can be loaded at the same time. It also supports multi-component images, so color images, vector fields, time series data, and et cetera, diffusion tensor data. Um, those various kinds of data can be uh, viewed. Then, uh, as I mentioned before, the core mission of the tool is manual segmentation. So we really focus on this. And for me, or well, the core, sorry, I should say, the core mission is segmentation and we have both manual and semi-automatic segmentation. The segmentation is a core mission. And under manual segmentation, we have two-dimensional tools like polygons, paint brushes, things like that that you would expect to find in any kind of uh, manual annotation tool. We also have a, a couple three-dimensional post-processing tools for cutting segmentations um, in three dimensions. Is, uh, share comments with your colleagues through ITK SNAP workspaces, and alignment and registration that was added a few years ago. So we keep adding features little by little, um, but the, the core of it remains the segmentation. So I'll go through um, each of these features um, 
by one with uh, one by one with these little videos uh, over here. So what you're seeing uh, right now is the image navigation um, functionality. Uh, here we have two images loaded at the same time, a T2 weighted and T1 weighted MRI. And uh, the user is viewing these images with linked cursors, so they are spatially aligned. And as the user is clicking in different locations in one of the views, you see the, the other views updating at the same time. And so this kind of three-dimensional linked cursor uh, helps you always focus on the same location in three-dimensional space. You're always sort of seeing the same voxel in three orthogonal views. And it's, it's quite useful for when you're doing segmentation, making sure that these segmentations are three-dimensionally consistent. So there's uh, zooming and panning functionalities, which is basic ways of going around the image and focusing in on parts that you want to um, see more about. Manual segmentation um, has a, a few um, fairly, fairly simple tools. So we haven't done a whole lot of advanced uh, things like live wire, like some other tools might have. Um, but you know these tools seem to be um, fairly useful to our users. So you see on the left just kind of basic polygon-based outlining of a structure um, in the middle using a paint brush, and then on the right there's this thing we call the smart brush, which kind of adapts to the image intensity and can be used to sort of quickly um, outline structures, you know, without having to carefully draw out every single pixel. <laughs> the bulk of our effort is on semi-automatic segmentation. And um, semi-automatic segmentation, the goal of it is input an image and output a segmentation, of course. And uh, the user here, is guiding the computer, sorry, by providing sort of the essential input um, that is needed for the computer to make the right decisions. So, so unlike in manual segmentation where the user is tracing out every single pixel or every single slice in the image, in the semi-automatic segmentation, the user sets a few parameters, uh, gives the computer a little bit of information uh, to help it make sense of what is needed in the segmentation, and then the rest is handled automatically. So complex segmentation tasks can be done in you know, a matter of a few minutes as opposed to hours. So this is how we approach um, semi-automatic segmentation. It's broken up into two phases. We have the pre-segmentation phase, and then we have the active contour phase. And in the pre-segmentation phase, what the user does is to teach the computer to identify parts of the image that are foreground and parts of the image that are background. So foreground are structures of interest, things that you want to segment, and background is everything else. So the output of this step is kind of a probability map or a heat map where uh, the foreground is going to have large values and the background is going to have low values. And this can be accomplished in a couple different ways. Um, a simple one would be just to use some kind of a soft threshold. Uh, a more complex way is to use machine learning algorithms uh, based on some quickly identified training data that I'll show you in a, in a minute. So this gives us a probability map. But this is not a segmentation in itself. The probability map is not enough to actually outline a structure. So the next phase, the active contours phase, involves the user placing seeds inside of a structure of interest and then growing these seeds to fill the structure of interest. And the way these seeds grow is guided by this probability map that you get from the pre-segmentation phase. <laughs> So here's a look at the pre-segmentation phase. In this example, we have a multimodality data set um, from a brain tumor study. 
so we have uh, contrast enhanced T1 weighted MRI uh, flare and T2 weighted MRI. And these images are being combined to generate this kind of probability map or heat map. So another way that is referred to sometimes is the speed image because this is a map that determines how fast the active contours in the next phase are going to travel through different parts of the image. And so here the values in white, these are high probability values or positive values, indicate foreground. The values in blue indicate background. And the values in between are areas of uncertainty. So the goal of pre-segmentation is to take these images and somehow coerce them into this kind of a speed image or probability map. <laughs> so we provide two ways of doing this. Uh, one is very simple. Um, the other one is a little less simple, but a lot more powerful. Um, the simple way is thresholding. So you simply take one image in this case. You can only support one modality, not multiple modalities in thresholding. And set a lower threshold and a higher threshold, upper threshold. And based on those thresholds and a smoothness term, this image will get converted into this kind of speed image. So basically, all the pixels whose intensities lie between the lower and higher threshold are going to have bright white values. All the pixels that are far away below the lower threshold or above the higher threshold are going to have blue values. And then pixels whose intensity is right at the border between, right at the thresholds are going to be gray and black. <coughs> so this works for certain structures where the segmentation task is fairly simple. You just have one modality. When things are a little bit more complicated, we use something else, classification with random forest. This is our other pre-segmentation strategy. And the way this works is that the user goes in and places examples of different tissue classes in the image. So in this case, the user placed these little squares. They're drawn with a paintbrush tool. And they place them inside of the uh, necrotic part of the tumor, the enhancing part of the tumor. Um, this green one is in the edema, and then some normal appearing brain tissue, and finally the background in purple. So five different tissue classes have been labeled, and you can see how this can be done very quickly. And then this uh, machine learning random forest classifier takes this information and based on that, classifies all the pixels in a three-dimensional image and assigns them probabilities of belonging to each of the classes. So in this particular case, we're interested in the tumor core, which consists of the red necrotic class and the orange enhancing tumor class. So as a user, we can specify which different tissue types we want to combine in our foreground object and which ones go into the background. So here, these the orange and the, um, the red are being labeled foreground. Everything else is background. And based on this, we get this very nice and crisp uh, speed image that really separates these two different tissue classes. There's no way you can get this nice of a um, probability map or speed image by just using thresholding. Okay, so, sorry, some animation <laughs> that should have appeared before. <laughs> so once we have this speed image, um, that's, not, that's not enough. Um, we have to, the speed image might have different areas where it's bright or uh, white, so high probability of being the foreground object. You know, just like in this CT scan, we have the structure that we care about, um, which I believe is the gallbladder, but I could be wrong. <laughs> I, I studied brain anatomy, not, uh, uh, unfortunately, abdominal anatomy is not my forte. But, you know, we have the kidney here and some other structures that have very similar intensity in CT, and so they're all coming out with this bright, uh, positive uh, speed image value. And we don't want to segment all this stuff 
we just want to segment the gallbladder. And so to do that, the user places a seed, it's a sphere, or a couple spheres actually, one here and one here, uh, inside of the structure of interest. And then these spheres are going to propagate or grow through this positive um, speed image region. And they're going to assume the shape of the structure. But as they grow, they're also subject to some additional forces that prevent them from leaking into very thin uh, or disjointed adjacent structures that also have a positive speed value. So let's see this in action. So we're seeing here these seeds spreading in each of the slides to use, as well as in the three dimensions, and joining together. And so they're occupying the structure of interest. And for the most part, they're not bleeding over into adjacent structures. There's a little bit of bleeding over that's happening over here. And so it's hard to completely control these kind of small bleed overs. Sometimes we can control this by going in, going back to the pre-segmentation mode and maybe going in and labeling this part of the image um, as background. So just re-emphasizing to the classification algorithm that it shouldn't be going in here. But sometimes we just have to, um, as a post-processing step, to cut off these little leakages. And for that, we have some three-dimensional processing tools. This slide is just to kind of um, re-emphasize this idea of these contours that are driven by different forces. So the red outline here is the outline of one of those spherical blobs that you previously saw. And um, there are two forces that are acting on this, um, on this outline. On the one hand, there's this image force that when the contour is inside of the positive speed region, where the speed image is, is positive or white, it's pushing out. And when it's uh, on the background region or blue, the force is pushing in. So it's basically acting on the normal of the contour with uh, magnitude of the vector proportional to the value of the speed image. It's a very, very simple um, term. And the second term uh, is a smoothing force, which acts uh, based on the curvature of the contour. So um, whether the, when the contour is uh, convex, it pushes inwards. When it's concave, it pushes outwards. And again, the magnitude of this vector is proportional to the, um, to the curvature. And so the action of this force is to make this simpler shape, shorter outline, or as close to a circle or a sphere as possible. And as a user, you can set the relative weights of these terms, um, as well as there's some other models that I haven't really mentioned, but they're uh, slightly modified ways of solving this um, active contour problem that you can also do in ITK SNAP if you're uh, interested in these kinds of algorithms. So here's an example of this whole segmentation pipeline um, being run. So the user first selects a region of interest around, uh, around the tumor. And I'll pause here and just mention, so, so this selecting the region of interest has um, multiple uh, purposes. One is that sometimes it's just another way of kind of keeping your segmentation from bleeding over into other parts of the image. So you say, I'm just going to segment this little cube or rectangular uh, prism in an image. It also reduces the memory requirements. And finally, you also have an opportunity to upsample or downsample your region of interest before you enter the automatic segmentation mode. And you know, sometimes your images can benefit from upsampling because you have low resolution image and there's some tubular structures like vessels that are very hard to segment using this kind of algorithm, but when you upsample them a little bit, um, they become easier to segment. Or you have very large images where uh, segmenting them at full resolution is too expensive. So here we have the region of interest now. Um, we are in this um, semi-automatic segmentation mode and the user is coming in and labeling examples of different tissue classes, similar to what you saw in the slides. So painting, Tumor regions. Yeah. 
and then they're going to paint the background. Maybe I'll fast forward through this part, part of the movie. Okay, let's go. So at this point, the user is selecting, looking at the probability map or speed image for different tissue classes, looking at DMAN, normal brain, other parts of the image, tumor core. Now have they, they've just combined the tumor core and the enhancing tumor to give us a sort of total tumor mask. They were unhappy with the speed image over here, so they added a little bit more training information. As you can see the speed image can be dynamically modified by just adding more training examples. And when they're happy, they move on to the next step. There's a little bit of a pause as this um, random forest is being computed over the entire three-dimensional region of interest. Now the user is placing a bubble, the seed inside of the tumor, turning on three-dimensional visualization and letting the segmentation run. And you can see it updating in real time in 3D. Okay, so they finished the algorithm, looked around, clicked finish, and now the segmentation has been incorporated into the um, overall segmentation. And this next part of the movie is showing that if you want to segment some other part of the image, once you've done the training, you don't have to do all that annotation again. You can sort of use the training information from the last round to do an additional segmentation. So here is the necrotic part of the tumor that's being segmented, you know, without any additional training, just running another active contour segmentation. So there's a more or less completed segmentation result. So um, this little movie that I played is from an evaluation study that we did uh, a couple of years ago where we looked at um, you know, how accurate is this tool, uh, this semi-automatic tool in the hands of three neuroradiologists as well as one student who has never had any radiology experience. Um, and the main thing is, you know, just the time to perform the segmentation was cut dramatically. You know, they were segmenting three different parts of the tumor, complete tumor, tumor core, and the enhancing core. And they were performing the segmentation between 12 and 24 minutes, which it would take significantly more time to do it manually. Uh, and getting results consistent with what was state of the art at the time for automatic techniques. This is another demonstration of this being used uh, for placenta segmentation in ultrasound images. Again, it's a difficult problem and um, very hard to do manually. And um, you know, using the ITK SNAP semi-automatic tools, uh, it worked out pretty well. So in the last couple of minutes, I want to um, show you just some of the more recent tools uh, that go beyond the basic segmentation functionality that I showed. What you see on the left is a morphological interpolation tool. So this can be used in um, various ways, but the main idea is that you, instead of having to segment every slice in the image, if you do have to do manual segmentation, you can segment every 10th slice, every 20th slice. You can do it in just one plane, or you can do it in two or three different planes. And then the interpolation algorithm we sort of will use shade-based interpolation to fill in uh, the in-between. And so it's a powerful way to speed up segmentation where you do have to rely on manual segmentation. On the right here, we have uh, a manual and automatic registration demo. So this was added uh, a couple of years ago where if you're loading um, data, same subject data from a longitudinal study or you have PET and uh, MR taken on different scanners, you can perform registration either by hand by rotating and uh, shifting images around or automatically using uh, rigid or affine registration with various metrics. And it's quite fast. So it's just a matter of a few seconds to perform a registration on typical MRI images. 
Another thing I want to mention is that um, ITK Snap comes uh, with two companion tools uh, installed. These are command line tools. Um, one of them is Convert3D, and it's kind of a Swiss Army knife of image manipulation and processing commands. So you, you can actually, on one command line, using these various commands, uh, you can create quite complex pipelines. And also, a lot of the stuff that ITK Snap does interactively. You can do it on command line uh, using this tool because a lot of the same features are provided exposed through Convert3D. And then Greedy Reg, or just Greedy, we call it, is a fast deformable image registration algorithm. So the rigid and affine registration I showed you is provided through Greedy in ITK Snap, but you can also do deformable registration um, through the command line. We haven't yet added deformable registration to the interactive part of ITK Snap. And in our group, we use these tools to build uh, most of our image analysis pipelines. So some very complex pipelines in some of our recent papers. I would say 80% or more of those pipelines are just calls to convert 3D or 3D reg. So I invite you to um, try these tools out and you know they're quite versatile in what they can do. Finally, and Allison will talk about this, uh, the most recent addition to ITK Snap is this distributed segmentation service which uh, when you really have a complex segmentation problem, you can't or don't want to do it yourself and there are uh, algorithms available to get to do it for you. We now provide a way to send data to the cloud and have an algorithm developer or service provider do the segmentation for you and send the result back to you in a secure way. And we have a few algorithms. Uh, most of them are Allison's or my work. So it's on heart valves or hippocampal subfields but we're working to integrate more algorithms into this um, distributed service. So I'll end with the slide, just uh, taking you to the itksnap.org website where you can download the software. Um, there are a few video training courses and a tutorial that you can uh, work on yourself, a 90 minute tutorial that should get you um, ready to run with a tool, as well as you can, uh, post questions on the user group there. So um, so that's the end of my part of the presentation, and uh, I look forward to Alison's presentation. Thanks a lot, Paul. So we're going to move to, to Alison now. There we go. Great. <clears throat> Hi everyone, my name is Allison Pouch, also from the Penn Image Computing and Science Lab. I've worked with Paul for a number of years now, and uh, my focus is on uh, cardiac image analysis research, and I'll be doing a demo today of segmentation of the mitral valve in 3D echocardiography. So this demo is going to highlight several features in ITK SNAP, some of which uh, Paul has already described. Um, it's going to show visualization of multi-component and time-varying image data. Sometimes um, image data isn't oriented in a way that's conducive to segmentation, so I'm going to be demonstrating how you can use the registration feature to rotate an image into an optimal alignment. I'll also show how to use text annotations to identify and store landmarks in SNAP, and also demonstrate the use of segmentation using the Distributed Segmentation Service, or DSS, where you can run a custom segmentation pipeline on a remote server. And finally, I'll also show how you can export segmentations as VTK meshes. So in this demo, we'll be um, labeling the anterior and posterior leaflets of the mitral valve in 3D echocardiographic image data. And uh, one of the motivations for choosing uh, this topic is that we've used these um, segmentations as patient-specific input to biomechanical simulations. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of the mitral valve. It consists of two leaflets, the anterior leaflet and the crescent-shaped posterior leaflet. And we're going to be doing the segmentation at the systolic phase of the cardiac cycle. So that's when uh, the valve is closed. Uh, the annulus is the outer rim of the valve. We're going to be identifying five landmarks in our image data, four of which are on the annulus. And those include the anterior peak of the annulus, 
the midpoint of the posterior annulus, the two commissures where the leaflets uh, come together, and then the midpoint of the coaptation line, which is where the leaflets meet when the valve is closed. So first I'd like to demo how to load an image into ITK Snap. It's really simple. Uh, you just drag and drop the image into the interface. Here I have a 40 echocardiographic image in nifty format. And you can see that Snap shows um, the image in three orthogonal planes and you can scroll through um, the image of the valve using the scroll bars on the right of each panel. Now this is also a time varying image. So right now we're looking at a single image volume at one phase of the cardiac cycle. We can go to the layer inspector and scroll through the other time, uh, the, the image volumes at other time points in the cardiac cycle so you can see valve motion over time. And here I picked a time point that we're interested in segmenting. Now just to give an overview of um, how this image is oriented with respect to our model, I show how um, these images are um, oriented with respect to the model I showed earlier. So in the top right panel, you can see that this image is passing through three of our landmarks of interest, the anterior peak of the annulus, the midpoint of the posterior annulus, and the coaptation line. Um, on the lower right, uh, this slice passes through the two commissures, the anterior commissure and posterior commissure. Um, and the commissures can also be identified in the upper left panel, which basically is like a plane that passes through the annulus. Um, so this is the optimal orientation that I'd recommend uh, to have your echo image data in if you're identifying these landmarks. And I'll come back to this later in the presentation. So first I'd like to show what um, our target segmentation would look like of the mitral valve given this image data. So I'm gonna load a segmentation that we previously created manually. Uh, you can simply drag and drop the segmentation into SNAP and load as a segmentation so you see it overlaid on the grayscale image data. And you can use the uh, visualization panel, the 3D visualization window on the lower left to see your model in 3D. You can see we've um, labeled the anterior leaflet in red and posterior leaflet in green, and you can vary label opacity as well. So that's uh, an example of what we would want our final uh, mitral valve segmentation to look like. So how do we get there? Uh, as Paul presented, there are separate, several different modes of segmentation that can be used in SNAP to obtain that type of uh, segmentation. Uh, the simplest is manual segmentation, and I'm just going to quickly show a demo here of using the paintbrush tool to manually trace the leaflets. So here again, I'm going um, slice by slice, uh, tracing the anterior leaflet in red and posterior leaflet in green. And as I go slice by slice and uh, trace the leaflets, um, I'll update the segmentation in the 3D in the 3D visualization panel on the lower left. And that's gonna show how the model is coming together in 3D as I go slice by slice with the tracing. Now here I did just a few examples of slices. Um, you can imagine that this would take uh, a long time to manually segment. It is a good ground truth segmentation strategy, but it does take uh, a considerable amount of manual input. So as a next step, I always recommend testing out the 3D active contour tools that, that Paul just described. Um, so here I'm gonna, uh, use the snake tool and define um, a tight region of interest around the valve. And then once the region of interest is selected, I'm then gonna wanna pick a uh, pre-segmentation mode to create the speed maps. Um, so the simplest mode, um, as Paul showed, was is thresholding. Um, and this nicely outlines the valve in our image data um, however, it's not ideal for this application because the image intensities of lots of the heart tissue are going to be similar to the valve tissue. So it's going to pick up a lot of um, tissue that's outside of the valve. So in this case, I'm going to try out the tissue classification mode, which Paul also highlighted. So here I'm going to um, label uh, several different tissue classes in my image. I'm going to use a single label for both the posterior and anterior leaflets. And then I'm gonna do a trick. And um, if you have a segmentation task where 
image intensities surrounding your object of interest are very similar to those in your object of interest, you can create a separate tissue class for those regions outside of the object of interest. So the yellow areas are where I don't want the segmentation to pick up the valve, and then the red is where I want the valve to be identified. I also use a background label in blue to identify some of the dark areas in the image as well. So I have three tissue classes that I just identified. I use both the image intensity and spatial information to tra train the classifier. Um, and it quickly creates a speed map that I can use to guide 3D active contours. So here I'm initializing my 3D active contour um, and you can see it evolve in the lower left window. Um, and this gives a, a very rough segmentation um, of the mitral valve. You can also um, do a multi-label segmentation too. It would just take um, more user initializations and an additional tissue class. So that's, that's the option of using the 3D active contour feature. Um, as a third option, I wanted to present um, a custom pipeline using ITK SNAP's new distributed segmentation service. So this is a custom pipeline that we've developed in collaboration with the Gorman Cardiovascular Research Group and the Penn Image Computing and Science Lab. Um, the methods have been previously published, um, as shown here. And basically, it performs a user-initialized mitral valve modeling using multi-atlas segmentation and deformable medial modeling. So parts of this pipeline will be performed within ITK SNAP. We're going to load our image, rotate it into an optimal orientation, and then landmark it. And then we're also going to visualize the segmentation result in SNAP. But the multi-atlas segmentation steps and deformable modeling steps are going to be performed remotely on a server through the distributed segmentation service. So I'm going to demonstrate how to use that service. So here I've loaded a different echocardiographic image. You can see that it's not in an optimal orientation. And I'm gonna go ahead and load this image twice. And I'll explain while I'm why I'm loading it twice in just a moment. So I'm loading an additional image. You can see that when you load multiple images, um, they appear as thumbnails in the upper right-hand side of each panel. So I pick my second image and I scroll through the component that I'm interested in segmenting. Next, I'm gonna use the registration feature to rotate the image into the alignment that I showed earlier in the presentation. So here I'm using the manual interactive tool, which displays a dial on your image, and I'm simply rotating um, the image into my desired orientation. And as I perform the rotation, I wanna mention that to use the registration feature, you always have to have two images loaded. Um, this is because there's one fixed image, which remains um, untransformed, and then you have a moving image, which is the one that you're rotating. So that's why we have two images loaded. So now I'm just getting um, the alignment ready for the landmarking. And then I'm gonna go ahead and use the um, annotation tool in text annotation mode. And I'm gonna click on the uh, landmarks of interest and associate them with text. So that was the anterior peak of the annulus, the midpoint of the posterior annulus, the coaptation point, and also the two commissures. And ITK SNAP stores the voxel coordinates of these landmarks as well as the text. Once this is complete, I save my ITK SNAP workspace. Uh, the workspace saves the image information, the landmark data, and the rotation that was performed so you can open it later. And we're gonna go to the distributed segmentation service. I've already logged in with my Gmail account and I'm gonna pick the pipeline that I'm gonna use, which is GoValveMitral. Here I'm making sure that all of the landmarks identified are correctly linked to the input for the pipeline. And then I go ahead and submit my workspace. So right now this is submitting a ticket to the ITK SNAP server. So the image, the workspace and images are being sent to the ITK SNAP server, which is encrypted. Um, the images get de-identified before they're sent to the machine uh, where the segmentation will ultimately be performed. And the images are only temporarily stored on, on the machine where the segmentation is performed before the result is returned back to ITK SNAP. 
So now the um, we're going to get progress reports for um, the segmentation. Now the segmentation is running on a machine um, at our institution. And um, this pipeline takes about 13 minutes to perform. I, I sped up the video so you don't have to wait for the, the full segmentation algorithm. But very briefly, it's running a multi-atlas segmentation, uh, which makes use, it's a registration-based segmentation technique that makes use of expert labeled images of other patients' valves to um, help segment the uh, valve and the image that we loaded and landmarked. The advantage of running this uh, pipeline in DSS is that we can run it on a machine that has a large number of cores rather than on a personal laptop. So now it's performing a model fitting stage. So it's gonna produce a triangulated mesh of the, uh, of the valve that it segments. And once the algorithm is complete, it's gonna return a workspace back into ITK Snap where I can download the segmentation result and visualize it. So here I show um, the resulting uh, mitral valve segmentation. Again, the anterior leaflets in red and posterior leaflet in green. Um, you can save your segmentation as an image file format like Nifty, but you can also export it as a VTK mesh. So here I'm going to the segmentation menu and exporting as a surface mesh that can be opened in other programs. As I mentioned, our pipeline also creates a custom mesh file which was attached with the workspace that was returned from our server. So here I'm just downloading um, that mesh file and uh, saving that as well. And just to demonstrate that you can open these um, uh, meshes and other uh, programs, I'm gonna look at the mesh um, using Paraview. Um, so this is the mesh that was create, exported directly from ITK Snap. And then also I'll load the mesh that was created through the custom pipeline. Um, so that's the final result of, of the segmentation method. So I hope this gives a good overview of, of the segmentation functionalities in ITK SNAP and how you can use it to create patient-specific models of anatomy. Um, in the context of biomechanics, we've used um, these modeling strategies and others um, towards various applications in biomechanical analysis. For example, uh, mitral leaflet stress estimation using finite element analysis, um, leaflet strain measurements for both the aortic leaflets and mitral leaflets, and also um, as input to left ventricular CFD simulations. Um, these have been uh, collaborations with um, great colleagues in mechanical engineering, including the uh, Gorman Cardiovascular Research Group and Ben Jackson's Research Group at Penn, uh, Michael Sachs' Group at University of Texas at Austin, and also Patrick Seeger's Group at Dent University. Um, Paul and I are also working with um, Ankush Agarwal and Lukash Kajmarchik at the University of Glasgow to introduce some new generalized features for um, strain calculations into ITK SNAP. And we're really looking forward to sharing those with your community as, as they develop in the future. Um, and finally, I'd like to conclude with just some information, some of which Paul has already uh, shown. Um, please visit the ITK SNAP website where you can um, download the software um, check out the documentation and also there's uh, quite a few video libraries that give uh, detailed tutorials uh, even more detailed than what we showed today um, if you're interested in the dss uh, service you can even set up your own segmentation pipeline um, in itk snap and the documentation uh, for that service can be found here um, finally, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have in this presentation. I've also provided our contact information so that you can reach out to us after the webinar. I want to thank you all for your attention and thank you again for the invitation to present today. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So we have a few questions. Uh, Alison, you make it seem very easy with, with your segmentation. <laughs> So the first question uh, is about scripting. So you already mentioned that Convert3D uh, has uh, a few things that you can pipeline and put together uh, with 
uh, with ITK Snap, and you also talked about the DSS, that it has some pipelines that are already defined. So is there anything else you, you can want to comment about scripting or putting some more pieces together uh, about the segmentation pipeline? I guess, Paul, do you, do you want to start with that question? Okay, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, scripting, there are different layer, levels and layers of scripting. So, for example, there is some scripting that we use for testing the GUI um, that, uh, you know, you can actually, like, click buttons programmatically. But then, you know, I, I've never found an application for that outside of testing. Um, as far as, like, using the tools uh, like convert 3D and, and greedy, we, we use them extensively. Um, we we use them in, inside of Bash scripts. So you know th these are shell scripts where we call the tools from the command line. Um, it's possible to use them from Python, uh, but it's through the command line right now. Um, you know one of the things that's sort of on our mind is is maybe organizing a Python API for for these some of these tools um you know they already have a c plus plus api so you can um use them programmatically that way but uh we don't currently have python wrappers but it, yeah i mean like you know the last uh, big paper I, I worked on has been like histology and mri for registration um in ex vivo human brain imaging data and you know this is a huge pipeline and I would say probably 85% of it is C3D or greedy. And, you know, so, some of the other stuff are, um, you know, some small tools that are part of another package that we we have in, here in house. So, I, you know, I think you can do a lot of scripting with these tools for sure. You really can. And uh, for the mitral valve pipeline in particular, as Paul said, a lot of it is, um, uh, scripting with C3D and Greedy, it's um, the multi-atlas segmentation is a registration-based technique, as I mentioned. So we're using Greedy to register um, images from other subjects to the target image that we want to segment. So that's a big part of the pipeline and incorporates a lot of the functions of C3D. C3D is fantastic. I use it on a daily basis just for doing basic imaging manipulations, whether it's you know multiplying images, resampling images. Um, reorienting images. I mean, it's extremely useful. And uh, I put this together in, in combination of bash scripts, also in Python, so that that's really how we put these pipelines together. All right, that certainly answers the question. Thank you. Uh, we have another one. So it says how to automatically identify different regions without having to label them manually. So uh, the random forest algorithm is very powerful, but after all, you have to at least indicate uh, the regions, label the regions. So is there a way to uh, do it uh, fully automatically? Um, <laughs> if you want to get, if you want to get a uh, meaningless result, <laughs> yeah. No, but it, I think at any, any level of uh, algorithm, you, you have to have some human input. Um, you know, like, you know, we think of deep learning as fully automatic, uh, but, but you know, it is trained on data that somebody had to specify. So, um, you know, we, we don't uh, build in things like, you know, deep learning algorithms um, in the tool, but we certainly uh, intend for the this distributed service to provide a front end to those algorithms. And so, in fact, you know, DSS is basically meant to be like a clearing house for automated, fully automated algorithms or algorithms where you need some minimal initialization. So like in practical situations, you know, you, you need to segment the valve like uh, Allison showed, but you know, if it's uh, rotated 180 degrees, you know, even deep learning might not do a good job with it if all the training data is in a certain orientation. So sometimes you have some minimal kind of manipulations uh, that have to be done before you run the algorithm that you know you might not read about in a in a conference paper and so you know the tool has the, that front end to, to let you do that and then send it on to the automatic uh, tool great 
so I have the last question. So it says, uh, can ITK, ITK Snap handle virtual data sets? Or like if all the data set is loaded in the computer's memory, how do you handle large data sets? Because uh, actually DSS does uh, things somewhat else, but which is more or less a limit that, that you can work locally. Yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll answer that. So yeah, so that's, I mean, that's kind of a limitation. Um, this is not something that can work with data sets that are, you know, beyond thousand by thousand by thousand uh, voxels. I mean, obviously it depends on your uh, hardware memory, but it does, it does store the entire image in memory. Um, you know, the design for, working with huge data um you know clarity or rainbow things like that i mean the, the whole design there is server centric so the data has to be on the server the algorithms have to be on the server um and that's you know that's just not the model of, of this tool so yeah i think for now at least that's kind of uh, a limitation so it was it was built to to work with medical images. So images may be built by the users ourselves. Uh, it, they go beyond uh, what it was conceived for. All right. So that was our our last question. So uh, we want to thank you, Paul. Thank you, Alison, for taking the time to to tell us about this. Uh, we had a, a very nice nice audience participating and asking. So we are looking forward to do the second edition at some point uh, in the near future about uh, new capabilities or, or maybe new practical things we can do with ITK Snap. Great, thank you so much again for the invitation. Have a good day thank and you thank you all for attending. Thank you. Yes, uh, 45 minutes of your day today. Thank you.